Welcome to the Kindness Matters Podcast. In this show, we talk about kindness and how it has the power to change each and every one of us for the better, from the giver to the receiver. We're going to talk about all kinds of kindness matters, because kindness matters. Hello and welcome uh, to the Kindness Matters Podcast. I am your host, Mike Rathbun, and for the second time, only the second time, um, I have two guests on my show, and I am so psyched for that. Uh, welcome, Pay Carter and Abigail I, Bailey, right? Mm-hmm. Is it Bailey? Abigail Bailey, welcome to the show. Hello. 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 <laughs> You're so proper. You know what? I'm. I'm, and the audience will never see this because this is an audio only podcast. But I'm looking at you, Abigail, and you remind me of Bella Ramsey. Do you know who that is? No. Nope. <laughs> She's an actress, and she was on Game of Thrones, but then she was also in the HBO series The Last of Us, based on the video game. And just. Google it when you guys get done. Then okay, you, we will. You, you remind me a great deal of her. Anyway, so um, you guys, both individually and collectively as as mother daughter, have been through some stuff. Um, right? <laughs> yeah. Abigail's like kind of maybe. Um, but I mean. Hey, first of all, you've been through some stuff, but you keep finding ways, despite all the nasty stuff that life has kind of thrown up in your way, you keep finding ways to get over it, not get over it, but to move um, through it and <laughs> move through it, figure out how to navigate and come the out better on the other side. Um, so talk to me a little bit about what what all is going on in, in Pay Carter's life right now. Oh, sure. So I am a disability advocate. I'm an author and public speaker. I have eight lovely conditions. <laughs> I have um, PTSD from serving in the military. I have fibromyalgia, dysautonomia, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos, generalized seizure disorder. Um, I'm also on the autism spectrum and then a eating disorder called avoidance restrictive food intake disorder. I think that's the full list. Wow. (laughs) After a while, I have to try to remember, like, make sure I get all of them. (laughs) (laughs) Did I forget anything? Wow, that's incredible. And you have you have taken everything that life has thrown at you and tried to work it into bringing awareness to whatever it is. I mean, some of these things, fibro, I knew that was going to screw me up. <laughs> Fibromyalgia, it's, it's a simple word, Mike. Um, you know, a lot of people already know about many, many, many people suffer from, but, but not everything. And and you've kind of, you've taken that and you've spoken out about it to shine a light on it. And, and I think that's incredible. Tell me about your, your theater work. Oh, sure. (laughs) So, um, Many years ago, I started collecting stories from military sexual trauma survivors from across the country. I collected uh, their writings, poems, all sorts of things, um, and I put them into a theater project called Speaking Out Why I Stand, which was performed in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and then later San Diego, California. San Diego. I love San Diego. Old mm-hmm. town. My, my parents... Fun fact means absolutely nothing. Used to live just <laughs> north of San Diego in uh, Encinitas, and yeah, I visited a couple times, and it was glorious. So, and, and this was this was an effort to to raise awareness mm-hmm. of that. And I think it's it it's, was cathartic in a way for the actors as well, right? Sure. So it wasn't the people that were. Um, in the play, the actors, um, they weren't actually the ones that experienced it. 
Okay. Um, it was people they were from reading the community. other survivors. Yeah, so you know. it it was great because not only does it educate the community, but then also you have people that are actually like playing this person that you know and living through their situation. So it was very eye opening, um, and it really it made me understand the impact of storytelling and narrative justice. It's very powerful. Did a quick, again, side note, did any of the, the authors, the writers get to meet the people that were playing them? Um, I didn't not know the how people, did that go? Not the people playing them, but so there was a story that I had collected from a Marine veteran, um, and it was about his daughter who was also um, a Marine and she was suddenly discharged and he didn't know why. And unfortunately, um, she lost her life like less than a week, I think it was, after coming out. And he didn't find out why until he discovered, you know, all of her journals uh, explaining, you know, that she was a, that she was a victim to MST. And when I did the theater pro project, I wrote a poem, but I, you're not going to catch me on the stage. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> and so there was but somebody you're a public else that, speaker. I know, I know, but stage it's just different for me. Um but the person okay. that read my poem um actually so the actors that were doing it wanted some of them wanted to connect with the people's stories that they were reading and this woman Don who was reading mine um got connected with Gary. He's the the marine veteran who lost his daughter and they're now married. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> fun. So that was a really cool thing that came out of doing this theater performance, you know, this project, which is about a very heavy, touchy yeah. um, subject is now there's these two people that are married and gosh, they've been married for years now. So, oh my goodness, that's crazy. That's fun. I mean, crazy in a good way. But okay, so now when were you diagnosed with Ehlers-Danos? Um, I was diagnosed when I was 29, so about eight years ago. Okay. All right. Just a baby. <laughs> Everybody compared to me as a baby. So for for those of our audience that don't know what Ehlers-Danos is, and I do because I have a friend who has it, but can you explain a little bit about what that is? And, and this is for either of you. Abigail, yeah. you can... Feel free to jump in too if you want. <laughs> so Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, it's a group of connect tissue connectivity disorders. So there's 13 different subtypes. All of them come with some hypermobility in the joints and then things like stretchy skin, fragile skin, poor wound healing. So it's kind of, I like to explain it like it's, it's like building a body using a glue stick instead of super glue. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> because our whole body is made up of tissue, right? Our organ, like literally everything. And so when your body doesn't make the tissue right, and specifically it's the protein collagen that's faulty, it can affect, you know, everything in you. So that's part of why, like, that I have, I think, some of the conditions that I do is because having EDS predisposes you to other oh. conditions. Oh, um, I was not aware of that. Yeah. So, I mean... Everything from autism is linked to it, dysautonomia, POTS. I mean, there's a bunch of my conditions that are that it's common for people with EDS to also have. So Abby and I have the hypermobile type, which means basically all of our joints in our body are hypermobile. They stretch, they bend farther than they should. So another way that I like to talk about it, and it's something that we mentioned in our picture book, is it's like if you take a rubber band, Typical people, you know, they're stretching it, and then what happens over time? It stretches out, and it stops yep. being, it stops coming back. Right, it gets weak, yep, it can tear. Um, but that usually takes a very long time, right? Decades. For people with EDS, we're taking that rubber band, and we're constantly stretching it way far, too far than it should be going. So what happens is a lot sooner for us, we get things like dislocations and sprains and other injuries as well. So sometimes it's like saying you have the body of somebody that's quite a few decades older. <laughs> Guilty. 
Um, so like for me, I didn't know that I had this going into the military. So all my lower extremities are the ones that are messed up. So I have degenerative damage in my lower back, both hips. I'll be looking probably at a double hip replacement before no. I'm 50. Um, oh I have both of my feet are permanently fused. So yeah. <laughs> both Something your you feet can't are... tell by looking at me. Both your feet are permanently fused. Mm-hmm. It means they don't. Um, they <laughs> don't. They turn over. The audience again range. can't see this, but what? Yeah. So, like, if you grab your feet and then you know, like, your toes, and you can kind of bend them. I don't know, uh -huh. forty-five degree angle, maybe. I don't know. I'm horrible sure. with angles. I could take mine and flip them all the way over. Oh. <laughs> like hyper. I know. Do you get that response a lot? Oh. Yeah, that's usually or ew. <laughs> that would be disrespectful. So I've got. I've got. Um, plates and staples and all sorts of things. So I kind of have that typical or normal range. Of so it, it's kind of like double jointedness. Yeah. That's similar? basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one time you're the life of the party. Next thing you know. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> um, that's really cool. And so you were diagnosed at 29, you said? Yes. Okay. But Abby, you are much younger do you think Abby was diagnosed because you recognize symptoms, Pay? Um, well, when I was diagnosed, I got Abigail and her brother to a geneticist to get tested just because, you know, if I had known, I didn't have any symptoms as a kid. You know, nobody right. ever said anything about me being hypermobile or, you know, I didn't have any GI issues or anything like that. Um, but I went to the military and then, you know, having my first major surgery at 22, <laughs> I didn't yeah. want that, you know, for my kids. So I took Abigail and her brother uh, to a geneticist and oh, okay. open shut Abby. Abby has EDS. Um, and then my son, her brother does not. So, so 50, 50 chance you lucked out. Mm -hmm. Thanks mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so now let's, let's talk about, let's talk about this book because I think this is so cool. Abby. You're going to be a published author. What the heck? <laughs> Are you phased by that at all? You're just like a typical kid. You're like, no, I know I'm good. <laughs> so how did you, what made you decide you wanted to write a book? Well, so you're sitting around with mom one day and you're like, <laughs> Um, pretty much I wanted to spread awareness to other kids and people, and I also wanted to let other kids know they weren't alone, and I also really enjoy writing, so. <laughs> even awesome. So the, the, it just kind of fit yeah. like a neat little mm -hmm. puzzle piece. It yeah. was almost, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't remember. Um. <laughs> inevitable <laughs> inevitable was the word i was looking for so now you guys had somebody else um illustrate it right yes i was <laughs> looking at the cover and it's it's such a cute cover <laughs> yeah, well, not, was that i don't have good enough no, could, yeah, I, really, I don't think either of us trust each other it probably <laughs> probably end up being stick figures <laughs> if we <laughs> hey, I better than stick figures thank you very much hello <laughs> But yeah, yeah, no, I mean, so how long did it take you, Abigail, uh, to write it? Well, Abby, Abigail told me what she wanted to write in the book and what she wanted to accomplish with it. And then I helped her get that well, sure. out there. So, for sure. Yeah. About six well, months. Yeah, about like that. Yeah. It's a little yeah. different. It's a little different writing a children's picture book than it is. <laughs> it is, you know, doing well, yeah, a blog you're a or author. writing a speech, and you know, and so it's it's it's, it's a, a whole bit different, different process. Different. Mm -hmm. So, Abby, what's your process for writing? You go up in the morning, you grab a cup of coffee, sit down <laughs> with the laptop. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So, you're sitting around, you're playing, you think, oh. That's a good idea. I got to write that down. What made you decide the, to write the book or what made you decide you wanted to? I don't know. Too long 
Oh. It's so long. I have the memory of a goldfish. <laughs> well, what child. What was it like getting diagnosed? Um Yeah, that's a good question. Annoying. <laughs> annoying. Yeah. Uh, so what sad. were the tests like? Yeah, I can I can perfectly remember me bursting into tears afterwards. So probably annoying. <laughs> yeah. um, were there were there blood tests or well, I mean, what's so the testing like? There's 13 different subtypes, and the type that we have is the only one that they haven't identified a gene. So there's no genetic testing for the one. Uh, so there's a scale where they basically look at certain joints in the body and give you a point um, if you hyperextend with those joints. And then they also look at you know other things like, is your skin stretchy? Do you bruise easily? Um, do you have GI issues? Kind of what's going on there. So, um, so yeah. So we took Abby. I think you were about okay. six, six ish. Still my wife. <laughs> I'm sorry. Say that again. She still gets a little frustrated that she has EDS. So she had to well, give up some things she really liked. I think that was the hardest. Oh boy. Part. Yeah, I suppose things like dance and tumbling and and gymnastics are probably kind of out the window i don't know if you were interested in those oh, before gymnastics. But... oh yes gymnastics oh. <laughs> and of course she was really good at it which is likely because she's hyper mobile probably so she you was saying i can't have talent without being <laughs> you'd have been good anyway but but that probably helped you be super good <laughs> Yeah, she was, I think, in classes with, oh gosh, 12 to 13 year olds at the age of six slash seven. So, I mean, she was really good at it. And then the other part I think was difficult was no more monkey bars, which trying to tell a six year old they can't play on monkey bars. Especially when your window playground is made out of monkey bars. <laughs> yes. Especially what? I'm sorry, I have a little trouble here. My window playground at my old school is made out of monkey bars pretty much. There was like oh, two guys. I love the monkey bars. Was monkey bars. Yeah, doing those flips. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the monkey bars. I probably couldn't do it now. But still, <laughs> but I, hey, no laughing, you. <laughs> no. That's right, that's I okay. can't do it myself either, so. So, yeah, that pretty much sucked when they <laughs> said, no more monkey bars. Mm -hmm. It was a bit of a difficult transition for you. Yep. And then you have, what do you have at school? Chair. Well, you have accommodations. Yes, accommodations. Mm -hmm. well, what kind of accommodations do you have? Um, I have the ability to go on five-minute walks or under. Um, so walk breaks, that's helped. Like if, her, if she starts to get a bit stiff from sitting too long, she can get up and take a walk break. I have a special chair that looks like a gaming chair, kind of, in a mini version. Um, <laughs> nice. Because regular chairs are a bit hard to sit in. Um, sure. Oh, I have the ability to get a keyboard if my wrist gets sore and a scribe, but we try to stay away from that mostly. Now, is that because you use tablets in school and, and that can be difficult? I, why would you need a keyboard, I guess? It's, it's if her wrists get too tired from writing. So the first option is a keyboard, you know, because then you're not moving your wrist around too much or your finger, you know, you're not gripping a pencil. Got it. Then, Got it. If it's like a really long amount of writing or she's having a really bad day, she's allowed to have a scribe. So where she would dictate to a teacher and they would write it. Um, kind of like writing a book. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Yep. Um, what about Jim? Oh. I have the ability to, we do like a lot of like mile runs, like laps outside to get like, like in the beginning, like, so like, Two times a year, there will be a mile run, which I fully cannot do that without having very bad ankle pain in the morning and leg pain. Same. 
<laughs> and then um, if we're doing like a lot of exercises, um, I have the ability to take a break or get a fun to do something else. Okay. Okay. So if her body starts getting sore, then she's allowed to, you know, do a different activity with a friend. Nice. Well, I think those are perfectly reasonable <laughs> accommodations. So when you think about this book, when you think when you when you think about somebody picking it up, maybe somebody your age picking it up and reading it, what do you hope they'll take away from it? What do you what do you hope that'll make them think about? I should have submitted questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I hope that they'll understand, I guess, a bit more about EDS and how that some kids' wives are not the same as theirs. And yeah, because that's huge. I think every kid thinks that every other kid is exactly, they have the same life. And I think it's hard for them to understand when somebody doesn't have the same life that they do. Especially. So that would be, this book will be a good help with that. <laughs> Lots of smiles. Lots of smiles. You are the cutest kid, Abigail. Um, <laughs> so what does the book follow? What is, what do we talk about in the book? Um, the book, um, do you just want me to give the one down? We can talk a bit about Some what it's, yeah, what it's about. No spoilers, but yeah, give us uh, a rough outline. Do you want me to do the rough outline? <laughs> yeah. Uh -oh. I, it seems like I'm joking. Did I touch a, did I touch a nerve <laughs> with no, a rough yeah. outline? No. 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 <laughs> okay. I'm just this is her. Spoiling. This is yes. That's one. She is. <laughs> What's that? She's very. She's not great at not spoiling things. So if she sees like a movie before you, uh, which happens something like that. That it's it's you have to keep saying like stop, oh stop, God. stop. I haven't seen it yet. So, uh, but the book it just it it's based on her lived experience. So it's not a story okay. that we just you know made up. It talks about getting diagnosed and then trying to navigate school with accommodations. You know, when you look typical, you don't look like you need them. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, at, I guess at your age, you don't normally hear the term invisible disabilities until you have them, right? Yeah. So is, is the character, the main character in the book, is her name Abigail too? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yes, sir. Bob. Um, you guys are are really helping others out there, and I really love that. I absolutely. I think that's the definition of kindness. Really, is teaching empathy, and and you're going to help so many people. And maybe it's not just Ellers, maybe it's some other disability, but I think this book is going to help so many kids empathize with other kids like you. And now we're still in the Kickstarter phase, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's launched, it launched about a week ago. We're about just over 30% funded. Ooh. We... Yeah, I know. It's very exciting. Very exciting. Have you ever done a Kickstarter before? I never have. Yes, this is our second oh, okay. one. We did yeah. one earlier this year for an Ellers Danlos themed coloring book. So it was just full. It's full of puns like flexi and I know it. My joints go out more than I do. I'm not clumsy. I'm just checking gravity. Oh, my gosh. Um, it's not swagger. I'm just sore. <laughs> Um, and so it was actually almost 900% funded. It was very, 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 very successful. Excellent. So we have high hopes for, you know, this book too. We, I haven't actually told Abby all of this, uh -oh. but uh, my partner and I were at the Milwaukee Pride event last weekend. We had the opportunity to advertise and talk about the book. Oh, how cool. Yes. 
Very cool. She knew that part. But um, what I haven't had a chance to tell her is that we had, you know, I have a big banner, right, that has our faces in the book title. We had over 60 people come up that either had Ehlers-Danlos or a loved one with Ehlers-Danlos um, that were just very excited and then very unexpected to see, you know, a table talking yeah. about Ehlers-Danlos at an LGBTQ pride event. Um, then we had, we had a couple of people that were in tears because they had never met another person with Ehlers-Danlos. So the fact that we were there having a table talking about it, the fact that this lovely, lovely person <laughs> is wanting to put out a book and share her experiences it was very moving. Yeah. It was is exhausting for me because you know, I've done tabling before and it's maybe, you know, two days where it's like five hours each, but the first day was six hours and the next was nine. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so it was very exhausting for me, but it was it was worth it, you know, having meeting so many people yeah. um, that had it and just were unexpectedly like just surprised to see somebody there talking about it. Um, and that somebody's going to gonna write a book about it. Younger generations. Yeah, that there's younger generations that are out there unafraid to talk about it was really neat. Um, we had And we had a lot of teachers. We had a lot of teachers, special ed teachers, medical professionals that were very excited about it as well. And then also like, how did I not know about Ehlers-Danlos? And being able to educate them on it was, was pretty wow. neat too. So many people being reached. That's mm -hmm. awesome. All thanks to Abigail and her book. Mm -hmm. You could be proud of that. I mean, and that's something you can mm -hmm. carry with you into adulthood. Nice. And at some hey, point you'll a have a grandchild person. and she'll say, Grandma, tell me about the time you wrote a book. You're like, I don't and even want to think about that. There will be more. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I could see like a whole series of books. All start is she yep. Okay, old man. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on, guys. I really do appreciate it. You guys are two of the kindest people I have ever had the pleasure of knowing. And <laughs> I don't you. say that to everybody. So <laughs> you guys are special and I wanna thank you so much for for taking the time out to talk to me. Thank you for having us. All the links. It's always great to have an opportunity. I'll have links for the <laughs> for the Kickstarter and the book and all of your links pay will all be in the show notes. And I'll note too quickly yeah. if there's people that don't need a picture book, we have ally shirts. So like the future is accessible, make pride accessible. We have the coloring book, there's stickers, there's all sorts of things. If you're interested in backing the campaign but don't need a picture book, we have Many ways to do. Is so. that all in your on your website? In the kick. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the Kickstarter, and the Kickstarter link. link. So. Perfect. Okay. Thank you guys for your time. I really appreciate it. Have a fantastic week. You too. You too. What child dreams of writing a book? I mean, about her disabilities. That's just so crazy, but it's awesome too, right? Pay and Abigail, two really, really cool people. Um, I hope you enjoyed the episode, and there will be more next week. Check out all of Pay and Abigail's um, links in the show notes. And until next week, be that person who roots for others, who tells a stranger they look amazing, and encourages others to believe in themselves and their dreams. You've been listening to the Kindness Matters podcast. I'm your host, Mike Rathbun. Until we meet again, have a good week.